Hey, Grandmasters, Mike from the WCA with our first video from the spring 2014 session, welcoming uh, everybody back. We have a bunch of new students this semester, so this is going to be their first look at some of the work that we do. Um, so basically today we're going to be taking a look at uh, one of the games that was played in week one. So this is actually a week two update, but I'm going to show you a game from the four o'clock class, and it's going to give you an idea of what these, uh, the level that these players are currently at some of the things they need to work on and also share with you along the way some of the things Roos and I talk about when we're trying to get you guys better at chess okay so i um, playing the white pieces is Adve and Liam is playing black these two have been with us uh, for a little over two years now and uh, have both made an enormous amount of progress along the way okay so let's take a look let's get through the opening um, so Adve begins with e4, and Liam is playing a Sicilian. And right away here on move uh, three, Adve uh, chooses not to play an open Sicilian. And an open Sicilian is when you simply um, push your d pawn as white into the center and play d4. And let me let me take this move back and show you. So here's the mouse cursor. You should be hopefully you guys can all see this because I'm going to be using it a lot during the video. If you play d4 in this position, um, that creates uh, what's known as an open Sicilian because black will most of the time take that pawn. Um, and let's just say we take back with the knight here in this position. You'll see that the d pawn here for white has been traded for black c pawn, and that kind of opens things up, hence the term the open Sicilian. And that's the most common way to play because it creates a real imbalance in the position. Um, black having these two center pawns in return for white having a lot of space and very easy development of their pieces. Um, so Adve uh, chooses knight c3, which doesn't stop him from playing d4 at some point. Um, but as it turns out in the game, uh, for, for example, here after knight f6, he chooses the move bishop c4. So he's pretty much saying, you know, he's not going to go for an open at this point. And we've seen him do this before. So as coaches, what we'll do is we'll ask Adve, are you playing bishop c4 because you don't like the open Sicilian, or are you playing bishop c4 uh, because maybe you don't know about it? Because um, theoretically, in the opening, these guys, as they start getting to 16, 1700, um, they're going to need to know uh, some of these opening ideas. So from a coaching perspective, our first reaction is, why is this guy playing bishop c4? Now, it turns out um, bishop c4 has been played by masters in this position, so it's clearly not a bad move. I mean, you're, you're developing a bishop to a really strong diagonal. Let me just give you the mouse pointer again, give you an idea what I'm talking about. Um, and, you know, you're one step closer to castling here is white. So, you know, why is it a bad move? The only thing um, with the move is that, again, it doesn't give you an opportunity to open the game. And as white, um, with that easy development, again, it's, it's nice to have an open Sicilian uh, in your hands to play. Okay, so after bishop c4, um, Leon plays the move a6. So my guess is he may be a Nidorf player. And, you know, don't worry about the names of these pieces. If the 12 o'clock or 2 o'clock kids are uh, names of these openings, rather, I'm sorry. Don't worry about these names if you're one of the um, uh, lower rated or newer players. Um, just you know, keep, keep your ears open and eventually you're going to definitely pick all this stuff up. So a6 uh, looks like a Nidorf move and Adve, you know, he's a really good chess player. So he may not know the theory here, but I think he's concerned with Liam uh, kind of opening up the game uh, or taking some space here rather with the move b5 and he tells Liam no and he plays a4, which is a really good move because it's kind of clamping down in this square. And in this position, um, it's very common for uh, you Sicilian players to understand that bishop c4 is not seen here that often without it being an open game. So what's it doing? It's putting a lot of pressure on this diagonal here. So more common in this position is the move e6 from black. And by playing e6, you'll see the arrows. It kind of blunts or shuts this bishop out and at the same time gives you a square here on e7 to develop this guy so that you can castle as black. Um, also, if you're going to develop your knight, as Liam did back in this position, um, why not play knight c6? Arusa always shares a story when she was training for one of the Olympiads uh, that Kasparov was actually there training the U.S. women's team, and she had a similar idea with white, 
and she put her knight down here on D2, and, and Kasparov said to her, listen, when you get a chance to put the knight closer to the center, uh, you know, unless there's a concrete reason not to, you should always advance the knight, uh, you know, closer to the middle. So Liam in the position plays knight B to D7, but again, if you take a look at the video, uh, the knight on C6 might be a little more uh, active. Okay, so after knight here, uh, Adve just plays simple chess. He plays D3, and that just, you know, going to open up this dark squared bishop to come out. And then knight B6. Now, knight B6 is going to gain a tempo because I don't think Adve wants to give up this bishop for this knight right here and allow it to trade. It will win a tempo. The question then is going to be, what is the knight's future from b6? Now, it does allow this bishop to come into the game, but at the same time, after Adve's move, bishop a2, you have to ask yourself, what's the future in the middle game for this knight here on b6? Okay, now here, Liam takes a chance. Um, he's a very sharp player, and he... I think he would, if you gave him a choice, he might he would start the game down a couple of pawns. If you just give him a little bit of initiative, he just loves to play uh, active chess. But I think he overextends himself here in the next move. So already on move seven for black, we have something to talk about. He plays the move bishop to e6. And you guys have seen this idea in the, in the double king pawn openings where you can challenge a white or a black bishop like this. But in this structure, it's very, very, very different. You have to be careful about this. So Adve correctly takes, and Liam takes back. And what this does here is it gives Adve uh, something to attack, namely this pawn here on, uh, on e6. And I'll just give you a quick highlight there. Um, that is a target. It can be defended. Um, the problem is after it's attacked, uh, as you'll see in the game, the attacker, which is this move here, knight g5, is not so easy to remove. Um, I, want you, I want to take you back to this position, though. Um, rather than rush in with the move knight g5, I want to bring your attention back to our friend here on b6. This pawn on e6 isn't running away, right? So can you guys see a move in this position that white can play to kind of take advantage of this knight's placement? And... That move here would be a5. Now, a5 gains a lot of space for this rook here on a1. And I know this seems a long, long way uh, in the future, but if you can imagine later in this game this pawn ever pushing forward, and look at this rook lift. This is a pretty cool idea. Rook a4 and over. Um, this pawn move on a5 would not only stop these two pawns up here on the queen side from advancing easily, but at the same time, it gives this rook uh, a future for the middle game to possibly attack. And let's not forget, right now, this knight here on b6 uh, is under attack. So let's say he goes to d7. Now we play g5. And the idea of knight g5 now um, is this, this pawn could not be protected by the queen. So let's say, in order not to lose it, black pushes it to e5. Uh, now we hop our knight in, hitting the queen. And, you know, we can just make some moves, say queen c8 in this position. Now I want to show you a cool idea. Because this knight is kind of fixed on e6, that stops this black pawn from moving. If this pawn can't move, check out the bishop on f8. This poor guy's uh, he's not doing so well right now. Once you learn to take advantage of pieces that can't move, you may find moves like knight d5. Now what it does, it does invite a trade, um, but I just want to show you what happens if you do trade. If you take, now the knight takes, I'm um, sorry, the pawn takes back, and your knight, let's say, hops to f6 attacking our pawn. Now we play the move c4. And I want you to look at this position for a long time and kind of appreciate um, what's going on here. We call this uh, in the business a bind, B-I-N-D, like you're kind of tied up. Um, it's not going to be easy for you to get rid of that knight on e6. And if you can't get rid of that knight on e6, you're never castling because you can't castle through a check. And it's going to be very, very difficult to get this piece out anywhere active. You have to move one of the pawns again on the king side to do that. And you have already have a number of holes here. So, you know, if white had a position like this, this would be, uh, this would be really good. Let's go back again. So 
in this position, A5 is a, is a pretty cool move to look at. And what about castling? Just castle the king and, and not attack the weakness yet because um, let me just show you, for example, let's say black plays h6 because they see your idea. They don't want you to come in there to g5 with your knight. Um, well, now that your king is castled, you can start stirring up some trouble in the middle. A move like e5. And by playing e5, you know, let's just take a look at some simple things. Let's say black captures. And now you get your knight on e5. And again, this is not an easy piece to get rid of. You could challenge it with queen c7, but we don't like retreating, you know, knights in the middle of the board. So what do we do? We develop and we protect it. And, you know, th these are very common moves I'm playing for both sides. Um, you know, at, at the 1600 level, it's very common for, you know, your opponent to just kind of lash out and attack your bishop. But you just drop it into g3 and you have this, um, you know, let me just highlight it for you. You have this diagonal and this little tactic happening here. Uh, when your knight moves, the queen will be attacked. There's all these weak light squares over here. Black is still way behind in development. Um, I don't think that's going to turn out so well for, uh, for black. Okay, so let's get back to the game. In the game, Adve jumps right in with knight g5, and it's not a bad move at all. It's actually, uh, you know, really strong. And again, um, typical move by uh, Liam. He's just fearless. Um, he plays the move d5. And by playing d5, he's telling Adve, look, you know, take the pawn, attack my queen. I don't care. I'm going to stir up some trouble in the middle of the board. Now, if you run this position on a computer, you're going to find that Liam's moves were probably going to get him in trouble. You know, if you were playing a master, you know, or, or, or uh, just a strong player in general, um, I think he's being a little too ambitious. However, and this is a real important point to remember, number one, he's really enjoying himself. I mean, he loves to play active chess. And number two, um, you are very often rewarded in chess for being aggressive. Remember that he's not playing a computer and he's not playing a master. He's playing another player, you know, his, his strength. And by playing this way, he's kind of making a statement saying, look, I'm not afraid to give up material to mix this game up. It's up to you to find the right way to, you know, take advantage of my moves. So let me show you what happens here. So Adve's kind of up for the challenge, and he's like, okay, well, you know, I'll take the pawn and I'll attack your queen. And Liam centralizes the queen. So he is in a bit of trouble here. Um, however, Adve doesn't choose the, the sharpest continuation. What he did was he took the bishop here on f8 because he's up some material. Uh, he doesn't want to lose his knight, and obviously that looks pretty good, right? But let me show you. Let's, let's back up for a minute. As an attacker in this position, try to remind yourself, when you have a knight this strong in the middle of the board and you're about to take an undeveloped bishop that literally cannot move in this position, you have to look for something better. Um, it's not easy to see. And it's not easy uh, um, to play this way over the board. But if you learn the trick uh, or the idea, you will at least look for alternatives in your game. So let me repeat it one more time. When you have an active piece, you know, you have a knight here on the sixth rank, and you're about to trade it for an equal value piece, you know, uh, three, let's say three points each. But in this position, clearly the knight is stronger than the bishop. So whenever you're about to do that, always look to see if you have a stronger move. And it, it turns out that you do. You, you actually have this cool move, knight takes d5. Now, what does that do? Um, it tactically prevents the queen from taking this knight here. Because if you take the knight, hopefully you guys can all see this fork here on c7, and black will lose the queen. Well, if you can't take the knight, um, you can take the knight here on d5, which is, you know, most likely going to happen. You would take with this knight on b6 which wasn't doing too much right black uh i'm sorry white takes and then black takes the pawn and gives you the problem again but remember you don't have to take the bishop on uh, f8 in this position so what can you do well you can bring out the queen and you can protect your knight um if they decide to challenge your knight this way now it's very very different to take this knight 
and not the bishop up here on f8. Let's go back again and just look at the difference. The bishop on f8 right now cannot move. If you take it, and I don't know, let's if they take back with the rook, black may, uh, or even with the king, black may lose another pawn here or something, but at the moment, this bishop on f8, if it can't move, that means this rook in the corner can't move. It really can't do anything constructive. So by taking the bishop, uh, you may be helping um, black along the way. If you take the knight, however, the queen will take back, you get to develop a piece with tempo. Your bishop just comes right into the game, uh, hits the queen. And again, you know, these, these very obvious looking moves, moves like e5 don't work because the king uh, is exposed up there. Just give a check with the queen and you're going to win this e-pawn. And if, say, they block with the queen, um, I wouldn't be in such a hurry to trade the queens here and help black develop. I would just, uh, you know, take with the queen on that square. And if you do the math in this position, you're up two pawns. You have the opportunity to castle both ways. Uh, the queens are coming off the board, and it's just the winning end game for white. Okay, so again, the lesson here is, and this is early in the game, don't forget. The lesson here is, um, back here, after knight g5, and then d5, right? We took queen in. Don't be in such a rush to take. Look for tactics when you have very active pieces. Okay, Adve takes. And Liam, again, to his credit, is one of these players that just is always looking for complications. Uh, and I admire him for that. I really like the way he plays. Um, the knight up here on f8 is trapped. And, you know, it might be able to sneak out and take another pawn before it's finally captured. But Liam is like, well you know, the knight's not going anywhere just yet, so let me stir up some trouble in the middle of the board. And he takes a pawn, and here Adve takes, and, and white is still clearly better here, but I want you to take a notice to what's happening. Queen comes off the board, and now with the queens off the board, the king in the middle, it gave uh, black a chance to develop the rook with check. King goes to e2. And then the rook takes on f8. And now the rook, all of a sudden, that was in the corner doing nothing, is putting a little bit of pressure on this line. The black rook here on d8 is controlling the only uh, completely open file on the board. And black is actually completely developed. So uh, if we do a count, he's down a pawn uh, here. But he's actually, you know, getting close to equal because of the fact that his pieces are uh, completely developed. And but all of you guys should know here that king safety is becoming less of an issue uh, with the queens off. Um, so this is taking on the flavor a little bit more of, a, of an endgame now. Okay, so watch the conclusion. Very good move by uh, Adve, attacking an undefended pawn. And again, instead of playing a passive move like moving a knight backwards to protect it, Liam comes forward. And uh, so he's actually defending the pawn tactically because if uh, white were to take it, uh, you might find yourself in trouble here as white because of the move uh, rook d2 check. And where does your king go here? Um, if you come down to the back rank, you're going to be interfering with the activity of the rooks. Um, if you come out, then you're walking into a discovered check. And, um, you know, it turns out king g3, you're actually going to lose a knight here. Uh, so that wouldn't be good. Um, so anyway, after knight c4, um, another choice in this position might be the move uh, f3. Now what f3 does is it keeps this rook from ever getting in. It permanently controls uh, or protects the pawn here on e4. And if Liam decides to play knight to b2, uh, grabbing a pawn, now we have this cool move rook a to b1. The knight shoots back to c4. Then we grab a pawn up on b7. And now watch what happens if you take the bishop. If you look at this position right away, uh, you'll see that white is still up a pawn. Uh, but black's pawns are really, really weak. I mean, all three of these pawns here are isolated. Uh, it's true that white has a couple of isolated pawns too. 
Um, but their pieces are really well placed here. The knight can come into d5 at some point. This rook may join his friend here on the b file, and I think white uh, is doing pretty well, right? Okay, so let's get back to this move after knight c4. Adve decides to take his h rook and challenge the rook on d8. Liam trades bishops, and here Adve takes with the pawn. And by doing so, he's now made his extra pawn uh, doubled here. So it's um, really interesting how this happened. I think Adve, you know, if you look back from the beginning of the game, he had the sharper tactical eye. I, I think he saw uh, the problem with Liam's move when, he, when, when that bishop first came off the board on e6. But what's happened here is he seemed to have kind of lost the thread of where he was going, and he's drifted into this ending where he's not necessarily better anymore because of the, um, uh, the position of his two double pawns in the middle of the board. And now, again, uh, to Liam's credit, he's just going to come out with the king. It kind of like fearless chess. It's like, well, you know, what can you do to my king? h3, maybe to, to stop knight g4 or something, and then here comes the king. Like, why not use him? And then Adve begins to fight for the file. Pawn g6, not allowing the rook to come up into this square. And then rook f2. Now, rook f2 is a big commitment because it seems pretty clear why he did it. Um, it looks like he wants to double the rooks here, but if it turns out that this rook is not placed well, the only problem with moves like this, guys, is because it doesn't have any lateral movement, the only way to get it back into the game is you're going to have to spend another tempo coming down. Um, so black ignores it and just comes up to e5, and then um, finishing his plan, rook a to f1, and then as long as this knight here doesn't have to move, there's really no worry about this line, and Liam decides to double on the uh, d-file. And Adve sees the idea and doesn't like it, challenges him. Liam uh, doubles the pressure. We have an exchange of pawns, uh, rooks rather. And then the move g4. And g4 is uh, designed to kick the knight out with g5. And uh, it turns out that Liam allowed that. So maybe in this position you can play the move h6 to slow that idea up. But again, uh, typical Liam, he's, he's going forward on the other side of the board with c4. And then the game kind of uh, ended up in a draw after g5 because um, the knight can take here on e4. The players exchange knights, and they get into this rook ending where after rook f7, um, you might argue that, that white is a little bit better because the rook uh, you know, is already attacking things with check and... Um, and, and more active, but after rook b6, um, you know, black is going to get his share of play here as well, even if you do take this pawn with check. Um, in the game, Adve played b3, and uh, they decided to call this a draw because of the, uh, the, the time in the class. Okay, um, it's a pretty long video, guys. It's over 20 minutes, but, you know, I hope you learned a lot here. I, I know I did. I really enjoy looking at these guys' games that remember you get rewarded for being aggressive in your games and and the other key point going way back is when you have a, an opportunity to trade a very active piece for an undeveloped one always look for something else um, just because of the the uh, activity of the pieces all right so um, hope you enjoyed it we'll see you guys in class